The uh, 2020 annual meeting of the Fitzrona EMS District is called to order on October 15th at 7.03. If we could do our roll call, Patrick? Sure, so thank you for, for bearing with me here. I'm gonna kind of just double check about the people I see. Um, again, normally we do this by a, a sign-in roster, so I'm gonna go through the list. Um, I see Mayor Richardson on here. Correct. Um, Alder Krause. No, um, I see Alder Maldonado there somewhere. Perfect. Yeah. Alder Arada Frada. Alder, yes. Ger Alder Gerhardt. Yep, I'm here. Um, Alder Schrader. Um, Alder Strassman. Here. Alder Clowder. No. And Alder Udell. No. Is it Udell? Udell. Udell. Um, and then I see commission members from Fitchburg for um, Connie Hilla. Here. And James Roberts. Here. Um, and then uh, from Fitchburg, I see Chief Paul Vermacher. I don't think I see anybody else from Fitchburg. So City of Verona, I see Mayor Diaz. Um, Alder Kemp. Alder Posey. Alder... Cole, right? Alder Ryan. See Alder Cronin. I'm here. I'm here. See Alder Journey. Alder Riki. And Alder Touche. And then I see Greg Miller. Yes. Derek Johnson was going to join us on the phone, so he may pop in because I know his his work usually runs him a little late. Um, is there anybody else from Verona I missed? Um, and then from the town of Rona, I see uh, Town Chair Geller, correct? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Supervisor, su Supervisor Mathis was here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Durst. Yeah. Uh, said Supervisor Wiederhoft was unable to attend. I thought I saw Supervisor Maxwell. Was that I? See. Oh, there he is. All right. Um, and then commission members um, Terry Schnapp, Dean Sue Lugindu, yes. Um, Teresa, it's Withy, right? Witty? Withy. W I T H. Welcome. Um, is there anybody I missed other than Deputy Chief Dostalik and myself? And uh, thank you, Scott, for hosting the meeting for us. So if I if I do my math right, it looks like Fitchburg has a quorum. One, two, three, four. Five with the mayor. Five with the mayor, perfect. Um, city of Verona does not, and the town of Verona does. Um, so just a kind of a quick reminder how the annual meeting works. Uh, the, the Commission Chair is going to do his welcome here. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll do my quick welcome. Thank you very much for um, taking time out of your busy schedules to kind of come to our meeting here when everybody gets to kind of connect with each other. Um, just take a little bit of time tonight. I, I don't think it's going to go super late for you. Um, but the reminder, the, the motions are made as your municipality. Um, so the mayor, um, the mayors and the town chairs are the ones who actually make the motions to approve um, or or oppose any of the uh, motions that are made tonight as a as a as an entity, um, and then when we get towards uh, when it comes time to caucus out, um, Scott, who's running things for us for Fact TV, actually already has everybody divided out into little breakout sessions, and he'll probably go over this again when we get a little bit closer. Um, actually, going to break off into your own little rooms, and Jeff and I are going to sit here and stare at each other. We'll put a little time frame on that. You can talk amongst yourselves, um, and then you'll all actually um, come back. Um, so that's how tonight's going to go. Um, any questions for me? Otherwise, I didn't um, I didn't get any notifications for public comment, but uh, Chief Paul Vermacher, as a member of the public, if you uh, I think you're the, you're the you're the public, got nothing. Nothing to say. <laughs> I'll turn it back I, over I, to uh, <laughs> Terry. Do you really want me to talk? No, I, I think you're doing a great job, Patrick. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I'd like to take just a uh, real brief welcome um, both mayors and the town chair. 
glad that everybody could make it this time. It looks like really good turnout compared to when we have in-person meetings. So actually this is kind of exciting. Uh, <clears throat> just remember when we do stuff now, all the motions and that, as Patrick said, are made by the mayor and the town chair. So let's move on and do a review and approval of the meeting minutes from last year, October 17th. And again, mayors and town chair, have any uh, corrections? I did email those out to the city administrators and um, Sarah Gaskell, so I'm hoping that they distributed out them, that distributed them to you. Um, if you did not receive them and want another copy of them, please let me know and I can get those directly to you. Um, I'll move approval. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, the minutes from the last year's annual meeting as written are approved. And now we'll turn it over to Chief Anderson. Perfect. Thank and you, I'll Terry. Myself. Thank you. Um, Similar to kind of how I run this in the past few years, um, I just like to run this annual uh, the annual meeting, similar to what we do for every commission meeting, which I can again remind you, it is the third Thursday of every month um, at 7 p.m. Normally, um, we <laughs> normally it's in Verona just because we have more space there. We did start moving it around the district just before COVID hit. So then we stopped moving around the district and have been meeting like about three months off and have been meeting virtually ever since then. Um, but met those, met those agendas are posted up to the municipalities. Um, everyone is more than welcome um, to please come um, or participate in uh, log Pat Marsh is attending here really quick. <clears throat> um, anyone is more than welcome to come to those meetings or uh, really easy to dial in now. So um, you're more than welcome to do that. So this is something, and I, uh, Chief's report, I give this <laughs> fancy graphics. I didn't pay attention to that one. Um, that was nice. Thank you. That was pretty smooth. Of course, it's probably going to start a slideshow by itself here. Um, got it under there, Scott. Um, so uh, I give this chief's report um, every month to our commission. Um, I actually email this out to all the mayors and the city administrators as well. So um, it's something that they can share with you. Uh, absolutely. But wanted to throw this out here. So this is actually a 2019 picture. I believe I shared this last year. This was actually the day we put the third ambulance in service. Um, we actually <laughs> did our best um, to get all of our staff and all of our ambulances in one place to take a picture. And that was the phenomenal day that we had actually seven o'clock that third ambulance was supposed to go in service. And we actually had our staff there and at 650, all three ambulances were actually already out. Um, so it was kind of a, I don't know, it was an irony or a coincidence is what it was. Um, but so this is a picture from last year, but that is all the staff that I love to recognize um, what they do for us and for you. A um, little bit of statistics about Fitrona. So this is the 2020, um, based on January 2020, from um, the state's estimated population. So we serve a population of 42,000 people between the city of Fitchburg, the city of Verona, Verona Township. Um, based on what we had for a 20, um, to our 2019 budget, based on that population of what the municipalities pay. Um, so roughly we're running our, our, our department at about $32.12. Um, every taxpayer contributes towards Fitrona. Um, that is actually smack dab in the middle of what it is in Dane County. Um, there are a lot of services who do it cheaper. Those are mostly the very small volunteer services who actually don't charge for their services. Um, <clears throat> and then there's some of the services um, that are smaller. I want to throw them out there, but are, are smaller services running some higher level of, of uh, higher level of care with uh, less in um, less call volume that are upwards. That I believe the highest in Dane County is about eighty nine dollars a person. Yeah, and the smallest ones, they don't charge for their services. They run completely off of donations. So we're smack dab in the middle of where everybody is. It's about 71 square miles we have of all of our districts. Uh, we are running three paramedic ambulances, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we do have the five ambulances. Three of them are running the front line, and we have two of them um, in, in a kind of a reserve component. They go into service during special events or when they're out for repair, um, like when a whole pops in the bottom of your oil pan and you have to take it in to get fixed or somebody puts a tree through the back window and you got to take that one out to get fixed as well. 
kind of throw Deputy Chief Dostelik out there for us. So um, that is actually why we have two reserve ambulances. We're in them occasionally a couple times a year. We're in both of them. Um, and then we have two support vehicles, car 15, car 17. Um, and that's what um, Deputy Chief Dostelik and myself um, tool, tool purposes, as we've kind of shared in the past, um, a lot of it is for driving back and forth between the stations, meetings, uh, going to meetings and meeting with staff, delivering supplies. Um, we're also first responding with those that, those vehicles as well. This is what our district looks like. Um, those stars you'll see where those are where those three stations are. I think I've got the ability to use a laser pointer here. Um, so here's for your perspective. This is Verona Road. The bypass there. So that's our station in Verona. Right there is that marketplace station. Here's McKee Road, only it's missing a bunch of orange barrels on it. Um, and then right there is that South Saim um, station. Our staff consists of, I mentioned before, 21 full time paramedics. Uh, myself and Jeff are the two administrative people who are overseeing those 21 medics and everything it takes to support them. Um, we have one office, part time office manager, that is Michelle. Uh, if you weren't on earlier, I shared she was unable to join us, had a family issue come up. Uh, so she's in there usually about, uh, well, during COVID, she was working from home, doing a lot of our payroll um, and bills, uh, bill paying. And then, uh, she's in usually about two days a week, manages most of our accounts receivable, um, in, still, uh, accounts receivable, and then helps with Jeff with payroll. And we have, uh, as of this morning, we have 15 limited term paramedics. There's some contractual language. We can't call them part-time paramedics. It's what everybody would know I was talking about, um, but that's essentially what they are. They fill in uh, the sick time, the vacation time. They'll come in for special events as well. Um, and then we have one volunteer paramedic, Tom Bates. You'll see him, uh, his name pop up later. Um, he's been with us actually for 30 years this year. So he usually rides almost every Sunday afternoon for about four hours. Um, so that's just a little statistics and demographics about Fitzrona. Here's actually the meat and potatoes that I, I share with our commission every month. Um, calls for service. We started off the year pretty crazy, um, insane, um, 10, 10 and 20 percent call increases. And then this bizarre thing that we've been dealing with called COVID hit and everybody is scared to go to the hospital. Um, so as you can see, the call volume has actually dropped pretty significantly um, over about the last six, seven months. Though our volume is actually going down, and this has been, um, we've been talking about this countywide at our EMS meetings, the, it's happening all the way across the county. Um, volumes are going down, but our patient acuity is going up. It's trying to do some public service um, you know, announcements out there saying, you know, we, we really don't want people, again, as, as COVID's rearing its ugly head, we don't. We're trying to keep people out of the hospital, right? That's where, the, that's where sick people are. Um, but unfortunately, we're seeing people wait a lot longer before they finally do call an ambulance, and we get them in a lot sicker states. Um, cardiac arrests, it have, it's been in Fitrona as well, but across the county, are at record numbers for Dane County because people are waiting a significant amount of time. Same with strokes. And, and so we're seeing a lot of sick people, um, but our call volume is down. I think it's just kind of the nature of what it is. This, the kind of uh, My mother used to say, this too shall pass. And we'll be back to normal. Um, here's how the breakdown goes. Um, so year to date, this is what the where our calls are coming from. So year to date, 61% uh, of our calls occur up in Fitchburg, 27% um, in the city of Verona, 3% in the town of Verona, and then kind of a smattering of other calls over the course of, of where we go outside the district. So this is our year to date. If you look at that in a pie chart, right? Visual learners and linear learners. Um, this is actually just the month of September. So it was actually only 58% in September. Um, this breakdown that I just showed you, that has stayed pretty consistent, plus or minus about 3%-ish, um, at least for the last four years. Um, and probably I can go back farther than that. So that that's roughly about the breakdown from calls said here it is just for the month of September. Apparently the people in Verona were a little sicker um, than those up in Pittsburgh. A couple other numbers that I special report every month that the commission has been reporting for a while. I, I changed this. This is actually year end numbers, um, but I give the month to months and then compare it to the previous year. I just went back and pulled from year to date stuff. So this is actually year to date information um, with the same time frame for the last two years. So as of, as of today, um, as of this morning in 2020, have given 53 doses of Narcan. Now, some of those are actually more than you know, one patient getting more than one dose. 
Um, something we've been tracking for a while is that opioid trend, the opioid addiction is kind of a headline out there. It's taking a backseat to COVID, but it's, it's still a problem. 43, um, 43 doses this year was only 49, same time um, last year. It was 60 the year before. So this is something that has not gone away, um, but we do continue to report it. Um, both of our police departments, um, both, or I guess all three, so the city of Fitchburg, city of Verona, and then the Dane County Sheriff's Department, they do all carry Narcan, um, as well as both fire departments, I believe, carry Narcan as well. Other thing I report is the CAR-15 responses. As I had mentioned, um, you know, Jeff and I use that predominantly, again, to move things between the stations and, and be available on the streets when things come up. Um, but we do respond to calls, whether that's to um, add an additional person, um, a multi-vehicle accident, prolonged extrication. We've hit the bike trail two times this year because it's easier for us to get down the bike trail um, than an ambulance and get that thing turned around and try to get it back down on the road. <laughs> um, so these are actually just times we have gone out on calls. The the biggest, I think, save, uh, kind of biggest benefit we've seen from it is um, most of these calls, because of the nature of where the ambulances are, um, if the Verona crew is out and another call comes in in Verona, um, Jeff and or I will both actually hop in the, um, hop in the car and respond. We're actually able to provide that first care. Um, we don't have a, it's not stocked to a paramedic level. Um, we do carry the cardiac monitor in there. We carry a handful of medications, a handful of ALS medications. Great examples to bring to you over the last few years is a patient with chest pain who was literally just down the road from the station um, as we're waiting for a Fitchburg unit to come in. You can imagine it's about a seven mile difference. Um, so they're adding a little bit of time. By the time um, the ambulance got there, we called and said, bring the cot in. Um, between myself and Jeff, right? We had the IV, we had vital signs, we had a 12 lead, we had it transmitted off to the hospital and they put that patient on the cot, you know, literally saved probably five to 10 minutes worth of time that it would have taken for them to do it um, to get him on the cot down his way. Um, same thing, very similar patient with an anaphylactic reaction where actually all of our ambulances were out um, and one of them was coming back on its way into Verona, but the closest ambulance was actually, it was coming from the belt line. Um, so that's how far it was. Um, patient with actually a significant anaphylactic shock, we were able to get over there and give epi, um, epinephrine, and one of these probably literally saved her life um, as the distance that ambulance was away, um, getting people there really quick. So we've, we've actually been able to make some pretty good um, pretty good, uh, pretty good accomplishments with CAR-15 and CAR-17. Um, now, as of, again, this is as of this morning, how many times that the CAR has gone out in the same time frame, 69 in 2018, 77, 29. Um, 2019, only 59 in 2020. Um, what I would, what I attribute the, the decrease in the times we have gone out in is actually that third ambulance, because that third ambulance is up in Fitchburg. It keeps Verona's ambulance in Verona. Um, so uh, another thing that it was supposed to do by putting that third ambulance in place. Other information I report is the fractal times. We actually look at this every month. A um, couple different things we look at is if we take it by a median. Um, there's a filter in here as well. So um, when I pull this, this is actually for only calls inside of our district. So if we get called into somebody else's district, I take that out of there. Um, it's also only for transported patients. So if we end up not transporting the patient, that call is taken out of there as well. The reason I filter it by that is calls outside the district will very much skew our response time. Um, getting from here to Ridgeway um, is a long drive. Um, the other thing is patients who we tend to not transport it's usually one of two things. We got there and they say, I'm not hurt, carry on. Um, either that or we get there and they are fairly complicated patient, com complicated care patients and we're working with them to find caregivers. Can you go? Can you can't go? And those on-scene times tend to be a little bit longer because they become a little bit more complicated. So these are kind of your traditional, we got called somewhere in our district and we transported this patient. So I'm still picking that medium, median time and getting rid of the uh, and those those um, outliers notified to en route. We try to get out the door by less than 90 seconds. So 1.3 minutes is our is our median time. We're actually doing pretty good there. Um, no en route to on scene arrived on scene. This is the driver of where those locations um, those ambulances are. Right. This is a geographic thing I can't change. Um, so our median time is actually getting to most of those patients in 5.87 seconds. Or if we look at the 90th percentile, which is the standard we're, we're holding ourselves to getting an ambulance to somebody 90% of the time in less than nine minutes. Um, we're, we're pretty close to being there. 
I'll put those two numbers together. Um, we're, we're great. Um, on scene to transporting time. So this is actually a number we look at as far as our quality control kind of thing. Our, the golden hour, or not a golden hour, but our, our standard is to be on scene less than 15 minutes, right? Park to drive, 15 minutes. We're only about 15 minutes away from a hospital. So we're, we're trying to do that stabilization of a patient on, on, um, on scene and get them going. So we're hitting our median mark of 15 minutes on scene. Transporting to destination, that is another uncontrollable geographic factor. Can't control how long it takes to get somewhere and then how long it takes them to turn around and get back in service, you know, mildly controllable. So most of the time within 14 minutes, they have turned that patient over. They've gotten what they need from the hospital. They have cleaned everything up and they're back on their way. So adding all of those numbers together and kind of a utilization number, this is another number we need to kind of watch as we start looking at, you know, are we meeting the needs? Are we providing the service that we need to for our district? somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. Every ambulance call takes 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so as we start kind of looking at how many calls we have per year, how many times a year is essentially our district left uncovered because all of our ambulances are out. So these are numbers we look at and report these to the crew, say, you know, you need to, you need to move a little bit quicker. Um, this is what I really, um, taking those numbers and actually charting them over the last two years, you can actually see what that third ambulance bought you. Um, 20, or 2018 is that red line. 2019 is that blue line. Um, what happened in December of, so quirk, um, though that ambulance was put into service in that northeastern corner of Fitchburg August of last year, because of the issues we had getting the station set up, um, there was no what we call pre-alerts. Uh, so pre-alert, actually, when you call 911 and they answer and say, hi, my name is Patrick, I live in Fitchburg, and I'm on Thurston Lane, it, it actually creates a 911 call and sends out a, just an automated alert that says, hey, Fitrona 43, you have a call on Thurston Lane. That's all the information we get. So they know they need to start moving to the ambulance and heading to Thurston Lane while they're answering questions. Um, and then they're getting the information when they get there. Well, because of the kind of programming and radio things, um, Pre-alerting was actually not able to be um, turned on until December. Um, and then when actually when it finally went live, you see in December how it dropped there, that 90 seconds, that it was actually very well known that pre-alert saves about 90 seconds. In December of last year, pre-alert turned on, and we've been at that green line ever since. Um, so um, very well documented um, in, in our numbers right here, that third ambulance um, produced our response times by minutes. Uh, which is actually it, it's it's what it was it's supposed to do, with the with the quirk of I don't know what happened in July, um, but it's it's inexplicable. Other than you see some of the, you can see some of the high points there is Verona Road. Um, that's what I'm going to blame construction on. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to get through that construction. Uh, so here's the um, this is back to the map that I had shared with you earlier. I've shared with this year every year. We we. Because we have such a, a, a zip code anomaly in our in our response district, we've been using this actually 12 zones of where we respond to back from when we first actually started doing the study to become a paramedic service. Where are we going? How soon are we getting? How soon are we getting there? And does it need a uh, paramedic service? So these are the 12 zones that we use um, with the three stations. Um, the state of Wisconsin actually purchased an additional uh, module to do, uh, does some phenomenal reporting on symptoms and, and does actually a lot of tracking. Um, uh, we, can, we can report out COVID symptoms and where they're hitting. Um, so we actually have free access to that and I love the heat map. So again, I think if my, my laser pointer is up here for perspective. Here's the belt line. Here's Highway 14. Um, here is Fish Hatchery Road, here is McKee Road, here is Verona Road, there's the bypass, um, Midtown, um, and here's where McKee goes to. So as you can imagine, where, the, where, where, where are the ambulances being sent? It's right here in this high-density population off of Fish Hatchery Road. Right? So this is our post road, um, Greenway Cross, um, down here, um, Chapel Valley. As you can imagine, that's where the, the density of senior housing is. Um, right over here is that McKee, um, McKee, Hi uh, McKee, Williamsburg, um, Smithfield, um, uh, not Smithfield, but um, Chesapeake. Um, so that's that neighborhood right here. When do we get into Verona? So here's actually Cross Country Road. 
This is when I go, does anybody know what building is over there? Noel Manor. <laughs> Again, a uh, high density population of the elderly population over yeah, here. Yes. Um, and then um, down here, as we move uh, down south of Verona, this is actually um, Paoli, Melody Lean. There's kind of another little bubble right there of, of places that we see. Um, so that's the that's the heat map straight out of, and this is actually um, did this for the last 12 months. So what does that look like for real numbers? It looks like this. So if we go back to our zones, um, that top number you'll see above the number. So if we look at zone number one, right, 0 0.46 percent, that is the number of calls, 43, or is it 43, 43, something like that, or 30, almost 3,500 calls last year. 0.46 percent of them occurred up in that zone one. Um, so it, you can see where, uh, you know, that rough math of 21% of our calls here, 35% of our calls here, 40% or 20% of our calls here. So 40, 50, 60, 80, 80% 80 of our calls occur in those three zones, which is where we have our stations, which makes sense. So thank you very much for doing appropriate planning and, and putting the resources where they need to be. Underneath there, you'll see then what our average response times are. So if you see Fitchburg, most likely that ambulance is coming from Fitchburg. And if you see Verona, most likely that ambulance is coming from Verona. And we have to do that based on our, um, the only way we have to separate that out is actually um, the ambulance numbers and where that ambulance per se lives. It is very possible that the ambulance could be driving. Um, if, if the Verona ambulance 45 is coming back from a call and they're driving down Fish Hatchery Road and there's a call next to them, they get snaked for that call because um, they're closer, it makes sense, right, doing our job. So that skews the numbers a little bit. But those numbers are, are pretty unimpactful. So where you'll, you, you can just see how long it takes us to get to those various areas. Um, most of the time that Verona ambulance is, is, is in somewhere in Verona within three minutes. Um, and now if that ambulance is coming from Fitchburg, you'll see it's nine minutes, um, but that's entirely possible that ambulance could be coming from here. It could be coming off of, um, off of Cell Sayin. Um, so that's a pretty long drive to get down there. So the big target areas we still have are actually zone 12. Um, with only 1.22% of our calls down there, I would venture to say 1.21% of those are coming from Oak Hill. Uh, but those are still those areas where you're trying to get um, that second, uh, as we look for growth of where we probably need to put ambulances based on density and based on um, transport times or response time. Other information or report calls by days a week, and these are really, these are really just kind of a fun, a fun fact kind of thing. This is where it is. Nobody wants to go to work on Monday, Wednesdays. Nobody wants to go to work anymore. Calls by hour of the day. Um, you can see where they occur. It's mostly between 8 p.m. and about 10 p.m. This is right here is information that I, I, I watch very closely um, as we continue to look to expand. I don't know that we need four ambulances at three o'clock in the morning. Right, the numbers right there say that's probably not necessary. Now, eventually, we will probably be that to that point. Um, but as we continue to put that next ambulance in place, it probably would be some sort of peak time ambulance. When we look at where, where is our greatest need, what are those hours of the day, um, and how can we schedule that and, and make it a, a, a sellable position that somebody wants, um, yet make it very efficient. More data. 70% of our calls, so every month I report where where things were at, um, the top 70 reasons that we're going out. This is actually the very first month ever um, where unconscious fainting actually popped up at the top of the list. Um, I have no explanation why, other than I think over the last month we've actually seen a handful of cardiac arrests that come in as people fainted, um, as well as we've had some overdoses that came in as people fainted. No, so this is the dispatch reason. This isn't actually what ended up being wrong with the patient. Somebody may have passed out. We got paged because somebody passed out and they were having a heart attack. Um, so we, I, I just report what we get dispatched to. Normally, sick person and falls are the top two reasons and they just flip back and forth during the height of COVID. It was sick person. As that kind of dropped back down, we were back to falls. Um, otherwise, about 80% of the past 42 years, it's been falls. It's been our number one reason for being dispatched. Um, shared this with you a little bit as we're kind of looking to, again, did we put those ambulances in the right spot? Um, Verona, uh, this is just for last month. Ver that Verona ambulance took 35% of the calls. Um, that middle station took 36% of the calls and that far northeast station took 29% of the calls. So they're actually broken down 
pretty pretty much where they should be. That Northeast station um, is the slower of the stations, uh, but that's again not where the volume is. Um, it, it's going to catch up. Uh, the town of Madison, <laughs> it, it it changes every day, right? But <laughs> as of as of this morning, um, November first is when the town of Madison Fire Department is being is is going away, and the city of Madison will take over that area. Um, taking that ambulance out of the mix of things, we'll put that ambulance there closer to a lot of places that will be covered by the city of Madison. And I think we're going to start venturing into the, the town of Madison um, a little bit more. So we'll watch those numbers and, and see what happens. That's the data that I report. On the back side of the chief's report, I send out every month there are financials. Um, so I put out there where, uh, where we're sitting at with all of our um, running income. So uh, this is what I get every month from our billing company. Um, we have some we have some goals to make sure that we are billing in a timely manner. The majority of our stuff is billed within 48 hours of the call happening. Um, that's very much depending on um, we, every call we have gets reviewed um, by one of about three different people on our staff to make sure it is complete. Um, it's not missing any procedures and it gets appropriately billed. Um, so 50, 40 percent of our 57 percent of our calls are within 30 days. The next one was 30 to 60. Almost everything is collected at 90. So there's still a spattering of stuff that happens after 90. Most of the, they get a 30, 60, 90 day notice. And after that, if they don't respond, it goes to a collection agency. So the ones that are still sitting out there tend to be, again, the complicated ones, workers comp, um, uh, motor vehicle accidents get really complicated about who's actually going to pay for the ambulance bill. Um, maybe they didn't respond to the first one, but they gave insurance information at 60 days. So now it's billed out there. So that's how come they kind of extend out that far. Um, there are patients who pay $10 a month and have been for five years. Um, so that's why there's a handful of those out at the 180 days as well. So we report that every month. This is the rest of the other kind of the update of the financial status that gets shared every month um, as far as where we're at with our, our checking account in our money market. Um, as we mentioned last year, the, um, we had more of our money sitting in a money market and then the checking account. So the majority of it said in there earning more interest. And then it was moved back and forth. Oak Bank is where we do our banking through. They've been a phenomenal partner with us. Um, Oak Bank set us up about a year ago to distribute um, more of those funds to be better protected through FDIC should something bad happen. Now more money actually sits in the little checking and the checking account than it does in the money market, but it just goes back and forth um, to, to earn the best, most amount of interest. That savings account is where our um, donations sit, our grant money sits, um, and our state funding sits. So the reason you actually see that number being so high is I'll talk about our CARES, um, the CARES funding we got from the from the government. Um, that is actually sitting in that fund as of September 30th. So that's why that's that's extremely high. You'll see it, that changed the previous month of that 37,000. Um, 24,000 of that came for our CARES funding and about 7,000 of that is our the state aid that we get every year. The CD there, so we actually have one CD sitting there. That's kind of actually where that reserve, well, that's part of where that reserve sits. Um, so it's actually sitting there in a CD. <laughs> Some years it's getting good interest, most years it's not, um, but it's sitting in there earning more interest than it would if it was sitting in that money market. Um, and then the WISC fund is what we opened up last year. Um, that was what, that information, the city of Fitchburg, when they kind of, I don't know, remember they diversified, or that's who they went through for some of their funds. So I didn't, the, we, we got a line as not through them. It just happened to be, we got directed, directed from the city. So we have our own account. It's a, it's a, it's a essentially a cooperative. Um, that is where the post-retirement healthcare funds sit um, because it's an investment account. We never lose more than we ever put in there, but the interest we get back on that account is significantly higher than if it was sitting in a CD. Um, so that's what that WISC fund is. We're, uh, we were earning quite a bit more out of there and, and based on the current economy, we get over $12 now last month, I think. Um, we were getting a couple hundred every month to kind of feed back into that. The interest from our CDs and the interest from our savings account actually feed back into the operating budget. So those don't sit there and grow. They go back into these. You'll see the line item, um, in the operating budget about interest. Um, that's where that feeds back into. So that's actually, those four things are kind of that, that cash on hand. Um, beyond that, based on kind of things how have, have been set up over the years, um, we have an assigned, some assigned funds. The ambulance sale and purchase, um, that's when we sold the last ambulance. Um, we actually put those funds in the CD. Then those funds will go to help offset the cost of the next ambulance. 
I mentioned FAT funds. That's a funding assistance program that's from the state that's based on, it's kind of a unique formula on the, on the size of our roster, on the population we serve and the number of calls we get. Um, we get two, two little pockets of funding on that. One of them can be, it's, it is dictated on what we can use that money for. It cannot go into our general operating fund. Um, it actually, part of it is earmarked for training. Um, the other part of it is earmarked for improve, unanticipated improvements. Uh, so what we actually used those funds on this year was um, uh, improving our um, airway management uh, tools. So we do, it's called video, and, uh, um, video laryngoscopy. When we need to put a tube down somebody's throat and take over breathing for them, um, there's a lot of research out there that uh, promotes using video. Um, so we actually purchased uh, the tablets, um, the initial investment in the tubes. And so actually, as opposed to getting down in somebody's face and you're trying to do a whole bunch of angular things and you can't see, this is actually a very standoff thing. You're actually staring at a video screen and doing a lot of stuff while standing back. You can get much better angles in there, a much better success rate. Um, so that's what the, those funds were spent on this year. Um, we still have a handful, a little bit of money left over from the bike medic program we got from Epic probably about six years ago, um, probably this spring or next spring, looking at um, replacing or adding to one of our bikes. Uh, and then uh, that money will probably be out in about two years, and then we'll have to absorb that into an operating budget. As I mentioned, the CARES Act funding, so that was actually given to anybody who, um, any agency who build Medicare. Um, so that was ambulance agencies, nursing homes, and hospitals. And it was based on a government formula based on what you previously billed Medicare for. That was the amount of money that was sent to you. Um, now, you had the, actually, the option to turn it back in or accept it kind of with a handful of, of uh, strings attached to it. Um, most of those strings didn't apply to us. They were, they were hospital-based type stuff. So really, the strings that applied to us were that you had to spend it on something COVID-related. Um, can't just put it in your general fund. Um, so what we purchased with that, and I've got uh, some pictures here in a little bit, we actually purchased um, some transport ventilators. Um, I can talk about that in a little bit, but that's the amount of money that we got from that um, had to be used towards, towards a COVID purpose. Um, and then as many of you are aware of, I've talked about the purchasing of our ambulance for next year and um, trying to put a hybrid module, an anti-idle module in it. Uh, we actually did get the approval from um, we actually were awarded that money probably about a month ago from Epic. So they donated $30,000 towards the uh, the addition of that anti idle technology. So that will actually help decrease the cost um, of our purchase of an ambulance for next year. So those are all assigned funds. They have to be used for what the commission has determined we use them for. And then in the bottom, you'll see we separate out that post-retirement health care is $218,000 for when people retire. Um, yeah, the, uh, there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, we actually did pay out one one of our previous retirees. Um, previously, um, before we had the WISC fund up, we were actually writing, um, again, post-retirement health care, so we were writing checks to our three retirees every month. Um, we finally got that set up into a third-party um, HRA um, that, that manages that for them. Um, it, it cost us, I think, an $800 setup fee. All the rest of the costs are now absorbed by the employee. Um, so we were actually able to get that one employee who still had quite a few years left, uh, as opposed to us writing him checks, we got him set up. So we did actually take some of those funds and kind of kick him off of our payroll uh, this year. Then the labor negotiations, that's something that's always existed out there as well. We get a better return um, from it when it sits at the WISC funds. So in 2022, when we go into our next labor contract, um, that those $24,000 are set aside actually to pay for the legal fees for that um, negotiation. Any questions on that? That gets reported up every month to our commission on what we're spending our money on. Perfect. I just want to share what we're spending, what we spent those CARES funds on. Um, so that's actually our transport ventilators. They came last week. So it only took us uh, seven months to get them. Uh, so just, it was still actually pretty impressive. Um, so that's what it is. Um, and that is actually um, Chance and Casey there training with it this morning. Um, so the plus side of actually transport ventilators, there's only actually only one other agency in Dane County that uses a ventilator and they use it for inner facility. So we'll actually be the first um, EMS, 911 EMS agency in Dane County to use transport vents. Um, 
you can see they're, they're about 10 pounds. It is about that size. What it does is it, it breathes for the patient. So a couple of things it does for us and actually the community at large. We try to stay away from patients. We know that COVID is actually a fairly airborne disease. It keeps us away from patients' airways, um, digging in patients' airways. Right? We know it's the job we got to do to breathe for them. They're going to die without it. Um, once we get that tube in there, we can back off away from their airway. Second thing it does is because it's automated, it gives us a whole other set of hands in the back of the ambulance. Otherwise, you're standing there with something and you're breathing for this patient. You're dedicating one entire person to make sure they're breathing. When we take their airway away from them, we are 100% of in control of their airway. So it's somebody dedicated to that airway making sure they breathe. Um, this gives us another set of hands. Third thing as far as patient-wise, it actually provides a consistent ventilatory and depth. Um, we, if you take the human factor out of it, we just we always say when you put something in somebody's hands, what are they going to do? They're going to squeeze it. Um, so when when people get excited, our, our, our firefighters get excited, right? then they, they get away from that 12 times a minute or 16 times a minute, what it needs. They're breathing too fast. They're breathing too slow. All of these in a sick patient is detrimental. So you push the button that says 12 times a minute, you determine based on lung capacity of 500 milliliters, you turn it on, they will always get a 500 milliliter breath 12 times a minute. Um, very consistent. It takes a while, us causing um, trauma away from their um, chest wall. I'm doing a lot of stuff. So that, that is benefit to the patient. It will add what's called BiPAP. So we currently have what's called CPAP for patients predominantly in congestive heart failure, provides some positive airway pressure. Um, it turns patients around. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal tool. It is a basic tool. Um, one of the challenges, though, with continuous positive airway pressure, which is CPAP, blows the fluid out of patients' lungs but it's constantly on. So as you're trying to breathe in and breathe out, you're breathing against this air. And that can be a challenge for some of our more frail patients. What BiPAP does is it actually has the ability to sense airway pressure. And as you're trying to breathe out against it, it will reduce the amount of pressure. It's a lot more tolerable um, for those very frail patients. You have to have a machine to do BiPAP because you actually have to be able to sense airway pressures. This will allow us to do that. Last thing is actually the largest to be as we early on in COVID, fortunately it didn't happen here in Wisconsin or in our region of the shortage of ventilators. And this is why it took us seven months to get our ventilators. Um, we are actually part of a larger resource of ventilators. And should that ventilator shortage um, have had or had happened here in, in the Madison area, we would have been able to provide those ventilators to an ICU. Um, we always have the option to do a bag belt mask. We're only with our patients for 15 to 20 minutes. We could have um, loaned those ventilators out to a hospital who could have kept somebody on that for a significant amount of time. So that now is a larger pool of resources available for our region here. So um, those, that money was run by our commission as, a, as an approval because there was a couple different options to spend it on. Um, the commission did approve that purchase. So they're here. Um, again, just came last week. You know, be a, uh, as you can imagine, I've described, it's a pretty intense um, procedure to do. You can really screw this up if you do it wrong and cause some pretty significant patient harm. So we've got about six weeks uh, to a month, two months or so. Our, our go live is no later than January 1st to have these on our trucks um, with everybody trained out. Other thing I report up every month is milestones, right? I like to recognize all of our employees um, for what they do. October must have been just a huge hiring month because that's when most of our, our employees are hit their milestones. Um, so uh, Chance, who has been with us um, for 25 years, he started off as an explorer, as a volunteer, was an LTE, and now he's one of our full-timers. 25 years, um, and then you can see Ross is 13 years. Uh, Greg has been there for 10 years, and then it's one in two years. We've increased our LTE pool pretty significantly over the last couple of years. Um, so those are all of our LTEs in one in two-year marks. Normally, I started doing this about two years ago. Is actually asking employees to come in and give them their their years of service recognition, uh, and they do it all virtually this year. So they actually will get a pin underneath their um, name tag. So Jeff is actually on here for us. Jeff is actually celebrating his five years at Fitrona. Yep, I see all the the Zoom claps. <laughs> um, Greg Bailey will actually hit ten years at Fitrona actually this month. Um, Kyle Wells will hit. Uh, he did hit 15 years in January. Um, Dave Snow was hired at the same time, so he also hit 15 years in January. And I had mentioned Tom Bates is our longtime volunteer who's actually been with Fitrona for 30 years. Any questions on 
that's so that's what I report with the chief report. Any questions on that? Is there something is all good? It usually doesn't take that long because all of our commission members have seen it before. So thanks for, for giving me some time to explain. Um, and, that, and please, if you're not getting that sent to you, um, let me know. I send it to the mayors and the city administrators. So just kind of a quick down and dirty of where, where is Fitzgerald going in the future. Um, shared this with you over the last couple of years and, and just keep updating the number too. So this is the history of where we were with Fitzgerald. Is that a chat? Sure, Ken. I will make sure that gets emailed out. Um, so this is where we've been going in with Fitrona over the last um, 40 years. Uh, so 2001, we moved to full-time staffing, and that was uh, myself and Sarah and um, Gary. Uh, we're actually part of that initial hire that made that that hiring that that full-time possible. It was shortly thereafter recognized the need for that second ambulance. Lived off of two ambulances for quite some time, as you're aware of, in 2019 is when third, that third ambulance came online. Oops. So this is kind of what the future looks like. This is making an assumption and, and actually have a beautiful Excel spreadsheet that every month I update the run numbers in there and it projects out where we're gonna be for 2030. And that's when I plan on retiring earlier than then. So that's all I'm concerned about for the moment. Um, sends us out to 2030. Uh, if we continue on a 3% rise, which is tends to be what we seem, have seen, and that includes this year, if we, if our numbers keep going down, we're probably gonna be fairly steady for this year, um, but we get those ups and downs. Um, by 2025, we'll be hitting 4,500 calls. Now that's making the assumption off of a known number of, of the little section of the town of Madison that will become part of Fitchburg in the fall of 2022 is roughly 375 calls. So we plot 375 calls into a 3% growth that we already see. That's 4,500 calls in 2025. Um, that is going to necessitate another ambulance to meet that need. Obviously, this is a, and always going to be in a state of, of flux. We look at this every year, and I report this up to you every year. That may get, I don't see it happening any sooner than that. My guess is that, if anything, it will be pushed later based on kind of the state of what the world is. Um, but, and as I mentioned, I'll see it, you'll see it in the next slide. I don't know that needs to be a full time. We continue on that 3% rise in 2030, which is a short 11 years from now. Um, we're looking at ambulance number five. That's almost 5,500 calls in this in the small district here in the next 10 years. Um, so bring it up to you because this is the, uh, in the long term thinking, um, this needs to be on your radar um, as, we're, as we need to kind of make sure that we're taking care of our population. What does that mean for me? Um, so I mentioned an additional ambulance number four in 2025 is what I'm looking for. Um, the plus side of how we how we purchase ambulances, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, is um, it doesn't really require any additional uh, capital purchases. We're actually pretty structured where we're at to take care of that. Where that may come into an impact is where our call volume starts to occur. Um, as the kind of the northeast corner of Verona starts to grow and the south part of Verona starts to grow and we take over the or that part of town of Madison gets absorbed into Fitchburg and they start building another school in the southwest southeast corner of Fitchburg and every time I'm at a department head meeting I hear senior housing coming up everywhere. Um, that's going to affect where you know one of, of when that ambulance comes into place how it gets staffed um, and then the only other option would be is if it starts, we start getting calls in some weird places in the district, um, do we need to move that ambulance outside of the three stations that already exist? Again, things that, things that are on the radar. Other thing that we're, I just have multiple ideas and Jeff and I talk about a lot and try to problem solve, adding a part-time ambulance is adding somewhere between four to five people. That brings our full-time staff up to 25 to 26 people, still only managed by two of us. Um, at some point in there, we need either to add a second deputy chief in there or some other the middle, um, the middle level management supervisory role. Um, multiple different options out there that we've talked to, some of them great, some of them expensive, some of them a little bit, I think, are, are really good options out there, but are we going to require some kind of union considerations in there? Um, but making you aware that those options are out there, 
if you're interested in any more of those ideas, I can talk to you about that some other time. Um, lots, lots of ideas that we've come up with, and I think we've got some pretty viable options. I'm running a lot of those ideas by the staff as well and, and trying to get some buy-in from them. After that, as I mentioned, 2030 is ambulance number five. I still think we can manage that with either three full-time administrators or some sort of middle level of management there. So that's what that's what I'm looking for as far as personnel-wise in the future. And capital, capital um, improvement processes with us stay pretty good because of how we utilize our ambulances. What are your questions about future of Fitrona? All right. So what I have for you and then the nuts and the bolts, and this is this is really why you're here, is the whole budget process. So I believe most all of you have seen this before, as I've done most of my presentations to the finance committees um, or the boards or the councils as well. Um, so you've seen this. Um, so what we're asking for is 2020 will actually be another uh, a replacement ambulance. But we do have a fleet of five ambulances. We keep an ambulance in a frontline capacity. We replace a frontline ambulance every two years. That seems obnoxious when I say we replace an ambulance every two years. We buy an ambulance every two years and we keep it for 10. Um, so that's that's the life of our ambulance and, and actually pretty much longer than most of the stuff that's inside of it. But what we do is essentially plan on replacing an ambulance and all of the contents of it about every 10 years. That absorbs most of having to do all of these additional CIP projects to replace monitors and cots because we just replace it with our ambulance. Um, all of our ambulances are finally the same thing. They're all Braun F450s. Uh, Braun is the ambulance manufacturer for us. They're all on Ford F450s. Um, the plus side of that, um, we buy our ambulances. They're Braun through North Central Ambulance out of Minnesota. They have been another phenomenal partner um, to work with um, with things break. Um, they, are, they are here, they are helping, they're on the phone, the parts are on their way. Um, they, they bend over backwards to help us out. So, and then I can buy one light bulb and it will fit all of my ambulances. So it's actually been kind of nice to have a consistent fleet of ambulances out there. As I mentioned, it lives because we have three frontline ambulances it, every two years. It lives for six years as a frontline ambulance. It lives as a reserve ambulance for another four years to give it that 10 year lifespan. About $370,000 to buy an ambulance with all the stuff in it. The ambulance itself is about 260 with roughly about another $100,000 worth of stuff in it. That did get bumped up um, compared to last year. Last year, as I had mentioned, mainly because of that hybridization of it, um, those bat that battery bank that'll keep the module alive with all the lights on and it'll keep it heated and cooled. So this will be our first investment in that hybrid module. Hopefully it is a, a positive thing and we'll be able to purchase that in the future, but it did add an additional cost in there, which we'll be able to offset this time with our Epic funds. So it'll be 2021, we'll be asking for an additional ambulance. I know each one of the municipalities has approached it a little bit differently by setting um, a smaller amount by the fleet, taking the fleet approach um, and setting up a smaller amount every year to, to avoid the spikes in the CIP purchasing. Um, I know other ones have said, we, we don't we don't want to borrow anything. If we don't have to, we'll just pay every two years that amount that you've asked. So that is what I'm looking for. Um, second project is the other vehicle that we have. Um, is our support vehicle. So that is actually a picture of car 17. It got delivered Monday, two weeks ago, two weeks ago on Monday. Um, and actually we just picked it up Monday from the graphics shop and with all the radios. Um, so not quite in service yet, missing a computer that's still waiting for that to come in and get programmed, but there it is parked in our bay. So this will actually be the second response vehicle we have. The anticipated life of those vehicles is 15 years, um, just because of the utilization between Jeff and I. So what we currently have is our 2010, um, and that's an expedition. That is planned to be replaced in 2025, so another four years out of that. And then we just got this one, the 2020 Ford Explorer. Again, I kind of have already explained to you why the use of two of them. Um, Jeff and I often find ourselves pulled in opposite directions between meetings and, and, and responses. And if, if I'm on the far side of the district and a call comes in in Fitchburg or Verona, um, we miss out on that response. So the other improvement project then would be is that 15-year budgeting which I know again has gone in the fleet management over the course of 15 years. And some of the other municipalities have said, tell me when you want it and that's what we'll budget it for. So those are the two big CIP prep, um, proposals. Rest of the stuff. So this is our operating budget and this is how it's determined. Um, I think I've shared in the summaries that you got, We the commission has decided to um, increase the base rates. 
we tend to increase, or they're at least reviewed um, annually um, to make sure that we're making sure that we're staying competitive with um, what the other services in Dane County are. Um, we are not the highest, we are not the lowest. It's another one of these, we are pretty smack dab in the middle of a resident bait is $1,100 and a non-resident is $1,200. Reason that there's a difference there is residents kind of makes the assumption that residents already pay taxes to support the EMS service, so they kind of get a, a tax, they get a break in their ride. No transports are somewhere between 150 and 400 dollars, depending on what we do. Um, that did not change. Supplies vary. Uh, there's kind of a formula that's figured out um, what we charge for them, and they're all grouped together. Mileage is staying at 22 um, voted miles. We increased, the commission voted to increase the standby pay to $130 an hour. It was $100 an hour. Um, as I've shared in the past, um, any standby pay is 100% covered by the entity who's requesting that ambulance um, because it's not available for the taxpayers. So we did increase the, um, the service, increased the transport rate um, and the standby fees for 2021. So that does then hopefully in return reduces the big taxpayer um, burden. That is based on estimating 3,700 calls for service. Um, that was determined six months ago before we saw this kind of big spiraling non-use of an ambulance, which is great when people aren't sick. Um, it's going to have an impact on run income. But so using those, those that information based on the historical data, we know um, that's how it was determined what run income will be for next year. Right now, we we get a return of about forty seven percent for every dollar for every dollar we bill out. We get about forty seven percent, forty seven cents back. Um, that does include the write offs that we're going to get from Medicare medical assistance that we have to take. Um, so those are straight out the gate. We're never going to collect a significant amount of that money. As we start looking at the spreadsheet, and this should have gotten, this should have been distributed to you during the rest of the budget process. So if you, again, I will share the PowerPoint with the, the, the group here so you can take a look at it. Putting all of those, those um, the charges for the number of rounds and what we get based on no transports, estimated that we'll get about $1.7 uh, million in run income next year. Um, that is down a little bit from what we've seen in the, the increases we've seen in the past years um, because we've seen that no transport rate climb over the last couple of years. Really, it's been that, that the location of that third ambulance going out into other communities and we're being turned around. So we just had to adjust kind of how many times. I can't just say we got called out X amount of times. We have to actually have to dig in and see just because we got paged, did we actually make a patient contact? So I changed that a little bit. So we'll see $1.7 million coming in and run income. The public education courses, um, those are CPR courses that we do. Um, same thing with contracted events. Um, th those are really just pass-throughs. So when we hold a CPR class, um, which we haven't had any of this year, the people in the class pay for 100% of the staff member who's standing there teaching. Contracted events is the same thing as a standby. The 100% of that is cost. Uh, it's, it's covered by the entity. So the plus side of things, um, though we didn't teach any CPR classes and we did one contract at event, I believe, um, though we're not getting that money in, we're actually also not spending it. Um, so it, it's really a wash. The interest um, that you see there is kind of just based on um, levels we've seen in the past of what we can anticipate. Um, as far as uh, expenses go, so wages and salaries, um, this is going to be based off of the contractual. This is pretty much going to be the biggest increase we will see in our budget um, is going to be, this is all the contractual stuff that was negotiated. Um, we did reduce the unscheduled overtime. So what unscheduled overtime, what that line item does is covers the sick, <clears throat> excuse me, the sick time, um, the unanticipated, or the vacation time. So our medics work a 48 hour work week plus eight hours of time and a half. Um, so that is actually built into their schedule. Those are, that is a known overtime cost. Every other time that they're not at work is an over an unscheduled overtime um, cost. We've actually had a lot of participation from our LTEs um, to cover those shifts. And it's obviously it's cheaper when an LTE comes in because I'm not paying somebody overtime to cover a shift. So we've seen a pretty significant historical um, look back historically and said we're not spending the unscheduled overtime that we were. So we reduced that by about $30,000. 
Um, hopefully our health, our staff stays healthy and we don't have to call them those LTEs. But that was one of the biggest things we were able to reduce. Um, the other increases you're seeing now, we still haven't received our health and dental insurance rates for next year, um, but we anticipate an 8% on health and a 4% um, on dental is what we go with historically to cover that cost. Workers' comp um, has gone up a little bit. We actually did have a couple work on duty work-related injuries. So um, for essentially personnel costs, went up about 3.2%. Most of those are, again, contractual and, and uncontrollable. A little bit of funding that I can change is a lot of the operational stuff. Um, so went up a little bit with fuel oil and lube. That's just because we updated the cost. It, it costs us more to get an oil and a, and a lube. Medical supplies continues to climb, um, hoping we're already about where we are. I've already about met my budgeted line item for this year already, and we still have uh, three months to go in the year. Uh, so increased it by 2.5%. We're just seeing those numbers uh, skyrocket. <clears throat> Shared with our commission members six months ago, a box of, or a case of gloves was $95. Um, as of this month, they're $140. Um, so just seeing seeing our medical supplies go through the roof. Uh, so that number just cranked it up a little bit. You'll see a pretty big increase in uniforms there as well. We have um, turnout gear that our medics put on before they're crawling into vehicles. It is not fire rated, so it's not as expensive as fire gear, but it, because it is, um, we kind of follow the same regulations as the fire department, it has a 10 year lifespan on it. So I have two individuals next year who will need new turnout gear. It's expensive. Um, so that's why you actually see that pretty big increase in next year's. We do repurpose that gear when they get the new gear. Um, we take their old gear and we provide it um, at each one of our stations then for when we have our part-timers. Our part-timers don't get gear assigned to them um, they get the hand-me-downs. Um, other things, when we have students on board, um, students will put on put that gear on so that they're protected as well. So that's your big increase there. We subscribed to NeoGov um, when we did the big hiring process in 2019. We hung on to it for 2020. Um, and we've actually been using it to do an LTE hiring process. It was a phenomenal tool for us to do our big hiring um, to staff that new station. It's actually been pretty good um, to hire our LTEs as well. The cost to subscribe to that um, for 2020 almost doubled. Um, it's not worth keeping it up at the current cost. It's going to it's going to use it. Actually, we save more money by getting rid of it and rebuilding it the next time we do a hire um, than it is to subscribe to that for a couple more years. So we got rid of that cost and reduced it. Um, went back and looked at some of the other line items, um, looked at the utility line item. I believe we found that was actually left over from when we were renting the station in Verona because nothing had come out of that line item in about two years. Um, so got rid of the light item because we the only utilities we pay are so the administrative um, space that we lease in Verona or the three offices we have, and that's actually built into the cost of our, our rent. Um, so that was 100% cut and $1,000 out there. Um, every year, look at our telephone costs. Um, so Verizon, we're able to kind of relook at some of the packages we use for our phones and our data use, unable to reduce those by even a couple dollars a month for a, a fleet of 13 modems and phones to reduce that a little bit. Um, trying to just look at any spot where we could cut a few thousand dollars and get this get this as down as, as much as we could. So took some money out of medical equipment, um, hopefully not having to replace anything with getting a new ambulance next year that will replace some of the equipment that sometimes fails. We keep that number pretty high just because the stuff we have is expensive. When it breaks, it breaks. Um, we do utilize a Meritor Hospital as a biomed service. Um, they're really good um, to do our preventive maintenance for us and can repair stuff when they can, um, but a lot of stuff when it's gone, it's gone. Reducing training um, as well as office equipment that it went up this year as we replaced two printers, um, replaced those I think every five years. Um, so that went back down because we replaced the printer. Accounting fees, all the rest of these things, I think we were able to keep pretty steady. Um, the, uh, the billing service is based, think was, our billing service actually collects or keeps 6% of what they bill out for us. Um, most other service billing services are actually a little bit higher than that. So we keep shopping around for that. We're still getting a really good deal, but that number there is in based on what we anticipate collecting. And then they take 6% of that. So the Patrick, part that you, it's yeah. actually 6% of collected. Okay. Yeah. I said, did I say build out? Oh, 
that they six percent of what they actually collect, which encourages them to collect. Um, the more they collect, the more they get to bill us for. So all of that little operational side of things, which is where I have a little bit of wiggle room, we're actually able to bring down about 0.5%. Um, so putting all of that together, this is the numbers that you really want to see. <laughs> um, based on equalized value, um, pull up one of my pieces of paper here because it didn't make it in the chart. So um, all of that run income is anticipated to be run income is going to cover about 55% of the costs of our budget, which means the municipalities, the three of you are responsible for the other 44.4% of the total budget. Um, so then we take the equalized value. That's what the 2020 equalized value was. We take all of that and divide it in one big pot, which means that Fitchburg was worth 50.46%, Verona 44.56%, and the town of Verona 4.97%. Um, so if I take what's remaining, the 44% left of the $3.2 million budget, it's minus that the line in the yellow there is what I'm asking you for. So 50.46% of Fitchburg is $721,000, 44.56% of the city of Verona, $637,000, town of Verona, $71,000. If you look at the bottom there, that's where you were in 2019. So the percentages changed up a little bit. Fitchburg grew a little bit. Verona grew, city of Verona grew just a little bit. Town of Verona actually went down because the other two went up so high. So the change in the contributions um, for next year was a 5.4% increase for Fitchburg, 3.63% for the city of Verona. And then because the other two went up so high, the town of Verona actually went down um, 3.2%. The overall increase in the budget was 4.33%. Was um, really, and most of that was salary and wages. Patrick, isn't our run income the 45% roughly and the municipalities are picking up 55 or is it 47? It's the other way around. Oh, that's so, good. Yeah, the whole operating budget was 3.2 million. Um, run income will be 1.7 million. And then so 1.4 million is what I'm asking the municipalities for. <clears throat> questions on any of that stuff. Yes, hold it right up right up. Yes, I have a question. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation. And you know, you mentioned that um, that eventually you're gonna come to ask for another ambulance um, for 2025 and then another one in 2031. So my question to you is, do you ask in also, because we know that every time that we add another ambulance, we need to hire more paramedics. So, so for the 2025, um, so it, you're planning to add more paramedics or, or you are fine with the staffing that you have right now? Or, because otherwise we need to, that one is another extra cost that the municipality will have. Yes. Um, so right now it's kind of some, there's some options. My current approach to that would be, as I mentioned, that peak time ambulance. So it's, it would be another ambulance, which means more people. Um, but at this point, you know, I can't see what's going to happen in five years from now. I don't know that we need to hire It's seven. I need require seven people to staff one ambulance for 24 hours. I don't know that I need seven people because I don't know that I need that ambulance for 24 hours. If I had that ambulance in service for 12 hours, um, I would actually only need to hire five people to do that ambulance for 12 hour days, seven days a week. Now, if we look at the numbers and say, you know what, maybe I don't need it on Saturdays and Sundays because the volume is not there, then that actually only means I need four people. Um, and I think we can, I truly believe we can, we can grow into that rather than taking that kit all in one year. Um, I think four people, five people would work out other options. So the city of Sun Prairie has actually taken approach. They have put in a, a third. They're <clears throat> two years behind where we're at. They're they're staffing a third ambulance, but merely from part timers. So they just throw it out there, and they have what so our equivalent of LTEs. If two LTEs sign up, the ambulance is in service. If they don't have two LTEs that sign up, the ambulance isn't in service. Um, I like the consistency of knowing, I mean, if the need is there for four ambulances, 
we need them for ambulance and not kind of when we can staff it and when we can't. Now, it's a lot less expensive to go that route until you can find that funding and maybe that's a stop gap. So there are a couple options that we're playing with about how do we do, because I know that is a huge impact and I know everybody's looking for positions. So how do we essentially play well with others and, and still provide that service, still grow as a service, but yet public works also needs people. The fire department also needs people. Um, so that is that is my hope that I can plan that out is that we can kind of piecemeal that in and maybe start with four or five people in 2025. Three years later, maybe we hire two more and it becomes a 24-hour position and grow it like that. I have another question if anyone there. Sure. Okay. So I am looking at your the budget that we have in the package um in the city of Fitchburg. Um, you know, um in twenty in the twenty twenty you have a paramedic inter program and you don't have it in the twenty twenty one. Why are you not doing this? So that came up, and I'm sorry, because it actually deleted it as a line on item, line item off of there, um, and that's why you didn't see it. So it actually didn't come over into the to the copy I copied up here. Um, as we're looking to, as I was asked by all three municipalities, every department was asked, we need to cut funding. Um, so one of the, I don't know, the easiest decision to make was there's seventy five hundred dollars in a in an internship program that. Though it is great, it is a great program. Um, it supplements, it provides a third-year process for the fire interns for both municipalities. We subsidize tuition um, and we'll send them off to school. We support them, we sponsor them, they work with our medics, and we, we pay their tuition, um, uniforms, and testing costs. In the long run, we get nothing out of that other than helping the communities and supporting our, our, our fire departments. We don't keep those interns. Um, they, we require two years of experience um, before we hire paramedics. So they graduate from their fire programs, they're an intern, and then they leave. Um, so when it came to cutting costs, it was kind of to me, and I brought it in front of the commission for a good discussion. To me, it was easy to take $7,500 at least for one year and take it out of there and reduce that operating budget. Um, as I, it was in the, the summary that got presented to all three municipalities as a significant budget change, we would like to see that come back, um, whether it's as soon as 22 to put that uh, 2020, 2022, whether to put those funds back in there so that we can continue to sponsor that internship program. But for at least one more year, when budgets are tight, um, it was an easy cut to take $7,500 out of there and keep that, that net zero um, growth. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna give you, can I do a follow up what you mentioned? I think that you mentioned before that it's hard sometimes to find good candidates, and this is this is a this is a very nice way to create a pipeline of future paramedics, and and I think that you know I, I am surprised to hear this uh, that we are cutting. I know I understand that the, the budget is tight, but you know this is a great program, you know, to create a pipeline of future paramedics, you know, people that, or at least they, they can try and see, you know, be, you know, um, uh, and to see if they, they, they have a vocation in the future to continue in this field, you know what I mean? So that's it. So we're still taking students because um, that costs us nothing from the colleges. So we still do take those students when they have to do their field time. Um, and we still... The, the fire internship programs have seen a lot of turnover as well. We haven't done anything this fall. COVID, you know, it's a great excuse, but it screwed everything up. In March, essentially, we said nobody, right, we're trying to reduce exposure. We took off even, even our fire interns. We didn't want to create more exposure. So unless you're a staffed medic, you're not riding on the truck. Um, those interns are actually back on the ambulance. Um, we are more than, and they can still be, they can still ride with us. They can still go through the paramedic programs. We will still sponsor them. We're just not paying for their tuition like we did before. Um, and would really love to see in January, we actually presented a presentation to our own, um, to the commission here to increase the internship program and actually create more of a, it's not an externship. It was just a different internship for those students who are 
didn't have an interest in fire, but really had that EMS interest of bringing them in on an EMS internship. So I actually <laughs> had the beginnings of an application process all put together and how we were going to make this happen when COVID hit and said, you know what, nobody's, nobody's set foot on an ambulance who doesn't need to be there. So thank you very much. I, we, I would really love to see you back next year. I think um, Alder Gerhardt. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, quick question. I, I noticed that there is 1500 for public education. Yes. And I'm curious what, what that looks like uh, given the pandemic this year and then also what you're planning for next year. <laughs> sure. So this year there's there's like $1,400 still sitting in there. We, we haven't done anything. What, what that does is it bought... <laughs> Two things is really what it buzz is by swag. Um, so when the fire departments have all of their open houses, um, it's the squishy ambulances, it's the pens, it's the pencils, it's the stuff we do for kids. Um, and, and then a lot of it, it, a lot of it is candy. Right? So when you drive the ambulance down the homecoming parade, nobody, if you don't have candy, you can have the biggest, fanciest truck. Nobody cares. Um, so it, that's... <laughs> Half of that money, and candy is expensive if anybody's a big Halloween fan out there. Um, so that is actually what that PR stuff is spent for. Um, we were, we do have some um, big flags, um, EMS flags, a Fitrona one that we can able to take out there. The goal, as it was included in the, in the summary, um, is to get back out and try to do some pop-up CPR stuff. Um, a big push, again, before COVID hit, the big push countywide was to do um, high performance CPR, which really includes, we know survival rates from cardiac arrest improve tenfold when they get bystander CPR. So the goal is to get back out to try to work with Target, Millers, whoever, and just say, hey, come learn CPR. That's what that line item for is. It's coloring books and crayons and water bottles and candy. Got it. Uh, I have another question. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Um, the billing service fee. Uh, so that one is you have an, a special software for billing, medical billing, or what is that? We use a third-party biller. The. Um, so and yeah, they charge you. Do they charge you per volume for per they hour? For six percent of what they collect. Oh, okay. So they have an incentive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it encourages them to collect for us. Yeah, um, yeah. we and we do. Like I said they're they're really pretty good. They have direct access to our system. So within about forty eight hours of a call actually occurring, um, a bill is sent. We try to get insurance information from the hospital, and so that is processed through. If not, they work on collecting that insurance information. Um, yeah, they. It's just, and I'm, I don't know when we switched over to them. It was. It was probably a solid 10 years ago, just as Medicare and medical assistance become really complicated. Yeah, um, no. They're the professionals. Um, they do a, Brad is our contact person there and does a, a great job. Can you entertain any other questions? Patrick, is the phone actually go, went down or up? The fa falls? No, phone, you know, telephone. Oh. Um, so it went down. Um, but it shows the, I mean, if you look at, it says 10,000 and then 10,850. So it might be something wrong with the formula then. It, it's entirely possible. It was a cut and paste telephone. That's okay. Just bring it up so you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll make sure. Oh yeah, this version says it. so. It, whatever you whatever you saw on your spreadsheet is correct. What you see in my PowerPoint was a bad cut and paste job. Okay. Okay. So yeah, okay. actually, yeah, when I saw it go down, it did go up eight hundred dollars, I think. Um, though the oh, we did look at the plan, so it was like a, we were able to take a dollar off a month a line, but because car seventeen now will have we don't put a phone in our response cars. All of the ambulances have a phone. And then they all have the biggest user of our data. They all have a wireless router in back of them. That's what communicates with the comm center. Every vehicle that we have, I know where it is. I can pull up my phone and tell you exactly where it is. Um, and then um, 
that is what creates a wireless router that connects our cardiac monitor, um, connects our computers up front. Um, so it creates a, a mobile hotspot as well as, again, that's what talks with the, the communication center to send all the data back and forth on that terminal. So I apologize. You're, the, no, it's okay. The PowerPoint Just was wrong. in case, you know. Yeah, thank you. I got to screw something up every year. Right? I triple checked it, copied it over wrong. Patrick, do you want to tell them about your billing and the accidents with car insurance and how you want to be so quick on it to get your ambulance fees out of it? Um, we Yeah, I mean, I sure I can. And that's a great thing that Brad does for us. So um, if everybody, you know, you're very aware you have your, your auto insurance, it, it's, it's usually fairly low. And I ours just looked, it's like $10,000 in medical coverage or something like that. Um, that is $10,000. And whoever submits their claim first gets that. Um, beyond that, it goes to health insurance. So that can actually be a pretty good challenge sometimes than to battle the health insurance side of things. So the quicker they bill, the um, sooner we get our money. Any other questions? And I don't see anything. So um, there are, we can turn it back over to Terry. Do you want to explain the process? Or you want to go for it? You're muted. Still muted. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tried to use the space bar. It doesn't work. Um, I guess I'll leave it up to uh, the mayors and the town chair if you want to go into caucus or if you want to just do like we did last year. Since it has to go before your legislative bodies, anyways, for formal approval. Um, if you want to go to caucus, this would be the time to go to caucus. So, Mark, Aaron? Uh, Tana Barana has a uh, quorum. Uh, Mayor Richardson, uh, you have quorum this year. Um, for me, you know, at a Zoom meeting, I'm I'm fine to do what we did last year, which is just go to uh, our monthly uh, meeting to get approval. Um, but uh, Mayor Richardson, you have a caucus. Would you, would you like to do it any different this year? No, I think that's fine for the newer people to council. In theory, we go to we would go to Cox and each uh, municipality would talk about it, and then we come back and vote. But all these things go to the individual bodies anyway for approval. So it's almost ceremonial as much as anything else to go to the caucus. We you know, have the budget process. We approved this along with everything else already. So that's why you know people are just kind of saying that it's not necessarily important to separate out, spend five minutes or 10 minutes talking about it and come back. We can just kind of use the approvals that we do through our budget process as the step for approval of this, because ultimately, even if we approve it here, um, and you see this more when we're adding ambulances and we have those big extra costs where, you know, if Fitchburg, for example, and this happened the last time we had an ambulance, they say, well, actually in our council meetings, we actually can't do the whole thing the whole year. We end up doing it a half year. And so then uh, we had to come back for that. And so, you know, it, I don't say it didn't matter what we voted in the EMS annual meeting, but we still have that opportunity to kind of vote yes or no later. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, move that uh, each municipality uh, comes back uh, with the approval of the uh, uh, presented budget. Is there a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we'll bypass the caucus. And I guess the discussion of possible action will be put off and you'll discuss it at your legislative bodies. So we'll move on to, well, is, is there any other questions you have for Patrick? 
around the budget and cap flow budget, operating budget. If not, we'll move on to any other business anybody wants to bring up. Hearing none, I guess I'd like to thank uh, Patrick for your excellent presentation and everybody for attending. And at this point, I guess, would support a motion to adjourn. So moved by. Second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you everybody for attending.